And no, I'd I like to welcome everyone. Vern is here today to tell us some about the history of Stockton Springs Fire Department. Uh, I wish we had as big a crowd as we had last year for your talk, yeah. but it's good to see everyone who is here. So, all right. So I did some research back into the 1800s and I couldn't find anything and the first I found was in the early 1900s. 19, approximately 1900 itself. Um, hold on. <laughs> Great sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> Research back, I went through every town report there was to 1900, and I could find uh, not much of anything. Uh, I'll let these people get in here. So let me read what I've written here. Stock Springs Fire Department dates back to the early 1900s when we had the Cape Docks were built in around 1902. At that time we had two firehouse. One called Cape Jellison Hose Company with a hose and drying tower, a thousand feet of hose, a bell, and 20 firefighters. And that was on the Cape. And, uh, oh, and a hose reel, I'm sorry. Um, it was down somewhere near the Cape docks. This was around 1907. When the uh, we also had a fire department up here, which was housed, not quite sure where it was housed <clears> at this time. They housed it in various spots around um, because it wasn't much. They also had a. This is the first report I found was in 1908, <clears throat> and it was made by the fire chief by the name of Frank Jackson. And he says, we have at present two excellent host companies, one at the village known as the Exclusive Hose Company with 20 members, and one on the Cape known as the Cape Jellison Hose Company with the same number of members. The Exclusive, which was up here, is equipped with two hose carts, one new, one old, a thousand feet of new hose, and 250 feet of old hose with a rubber outfit for the hosemen, complete all of which are supplied by the town of Stockton. To the Cape Hose Company, aided by public spirited systems in that section of our town, this is in debt to the new hose house, which was down there, equipped with a tower, a dry hose rack, and an ex elegant bell erected at their own expense at a cost of $250. The company has also provided itself with a new hose cart without expense to the town or the citizens of the town. Um, and they tell of about a couple small fires they had down there. I have to kind of skip along here. And that was obviously before the Cape Docks burned. So there was two hose companies. They had 20 men here, 20 men down there to fight fire. Then comes the railroad. When the Cape Docks burned, and everyone knows what the Cape Docks were, um, we had... Uh, they had not anything except these hose carts, so they had to be in a hydrant system. 
They didn't have any pump, as far as I can find. Uh, they just hooked hose into the hydrant. And the hydrant system was put in to the Cape Docks about 1902, somewhere around there. Um, they sent from Bangor by rail a steam pump down to help fight the fire. They all from Bangor, the town of Bangor, city of Bangor. We paid Searsport Fire Department $160 for their services rendered and Belfast $342. And it was a fine job done by both. In 19, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, I'm sorry. Um, little things like Jack McLaughlin was McLaughlin Bus Lines, which they he lived on School Street, and this building out here was where his buses were. Well, he carried men to the fire at seven dollars. That was the total bill to the town was seven dollars, and firefighters were paid around five dollars for fighting it. Um, Mr. C. N. Fletcher hauled the cart down, the hose cart from here down there, I assume, and J. W. Frazier carried with his boat, I don't know what he did, but he worked the Cape Docks fire at, for ten dollars. Um, P. L. Hopper which I believe owned a store, if I'm not mistaken, in town. And he had a bear. And he had a bear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he supplied pails to fight the fire. $13.80. Rather cheap. Mm -hmm. Fire protection. Mm -hmm. um, my grandfather fought the fire. My mother could remember it. It burned in 1924. And my mother remembered the smoke coming through the woods and the fields onto that side of the cave. Wow. It was that intense. Um, they didn't get it out for two days, as I recall. But they didn't have anything to fight it with. I mean, it was just a challenge back then. Any house that burned out of the hydrant system, they bucket brigade, that's all they had. Because they had to have hydrants. In uh, the fire chief in 1937 was George o Overlock. And the town instructed the selectmen to hire him at $25 a year. This is uh, all I could find other than this fire report back then is out of what was spent in the town to fight fires like Irving Sawyer fighting fire three dollars and fifty cents uh, Sid Berry fighting fire a dollar forty and Brian Sambin fighting a fire a dollar forty yeah and you know it was just nothing concrete as far as fire reports that I could find. The first fire truck we bought was in 1944. We purchased uh, for $90 from A.H. Blanchard. A.H. Blanchard was a fire servicing company up in Winthrop. They supplied hose and stuff like that. Then our next fire truck was right after World War II and it was housed right over there because in World War II, that was an army um, motor pool, and underneath it, there's a door, and that was the firehouse for this area, because there was no real fire service, and the military brought in a fire truck. And we still own that truck. It's in my driveway down <laughs> in the Cape. <laughs> it's kind of in pieces, because we've been trying to renovate it, and just money. Is that the La France? Yep, it's a 1944 American La France, purchased by the military, 
It still has the military sticker inside the cab. And the last time it fought a fire would be 1985, when it helped fight a forest fire. 150 gallons of water at a time it lugged and then and sprayed. In fact, Gene Ellis had our other pumper trying to save a house and it was on a lot of jack firs, what they call jack firs, which are small spruce and fir trees. And he was in there and they kept, with this old American La France, spraying water on him so he didn't get burned. And I mean, it was that we'll get to that fire after a while. And uh, let's see. There. And when they bought the first new truck, not the American La France, it was just a truck with a tank on it and. I don't know what it had for a pump, but it was made by Blanchard Company, and it was housed under the town office, which is the Lambeth building uptown. So it had to be pretty small, because the door under that building is pretty small. But that's where they housed it. They had another firehouse, which is where the overpass is, just above the church at one time. And when they put the overpass through, they discontinued that, and that would be 1956, right? when they started? 56, 57. Seven. And they moved it and it went up the hill and it's behind the house now used as a camp or something hmm. there and then they the carriage house that used to sit across the road which was part of this uh, property that became the firehouse. It had two bays and this 42 that's down there became the main pumper for this town. There's a lot of little things like his um, 1954 fire chief report. Say I found some. And uh, they had a total of 22 fires, 16 chimney fires, three house fires, two grass fires, one car fire, using a total of 201 man hours. And they raised a thousand dollars for the tank truck and materials that were kindly given. And the town now has a thousand gallon tank truck, complete with a pump and a thousand gallon, a thousand feet of hose. So that looks like 1954 was the first time they had two trucks, one to haul water and fight the fire and the other two being the main pumper. I know that the pump was probably a champion pump, front end pump, and we probably still have it because um, in one of these pictures here you'll see our truck, what used to be truck two, which has a champion pump on the front. And that came off the old tank truck and was put on this one. And it's, believe it or not, still usable. Um, they also had a ladies auxiliary, which were, um, they're gonna install a stove in the firehouse. They also turned over $75 to help repairs on the firehouse. Little, little pieces. Yeah. Well, you're, do we have an approximate year on the Ladies' Auxiliary? Oh, yeah. Oh, good. They had it right into the late 60s. Right, yeah. And what year did it start? Before? I have no idea. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's fair. That's, That's the really first fair. they mentioned it yeah, right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, they, it's interesting to read, but it's going to be boring for me to read every bit of it. Here's a report from 1955, and it tells they got one Scott Air Pack, which oh, is wow. air. That was the that was uh, Harry Patterson was chief at that time, and they uh, got some Indian tanks, a set of tire chains, and Allen battery charger, and 
some CO2 fire extinguishers. Oh, and they put insurance on. We paid $143 for insurance to cover liability insurance and property damage and fire and theft on our building and equipment. It was very hard to find anything. In uh, Harry Patterson again, 1957, he, uh, they put in fire phones, three fire phones. If anyone doesn't know what fire phones were, when you called in a fire, you called a number like 5673221 or whatever, and it rang in at various houses and, and the store. It used to ring in at Trend and Worcesters and probably at Bayern Sambons mm. before the Trend. Mm -hmm. And it rang in at different houses and it would be a continuous ring and you picked it up and the person would tell you what was going on, then you raced to the firehouse, or in some cases you had a button which would turn the siren on, which was on the top of the town office. And you had to know how many rings to push it. So if it was out back of town, it was four rings, we'll say. And if it was on the Cape, it might be two rings or three rings, and that's the way People in the 60s could tell where the fire was. There was no radios or stuff. Um, let's see. Oh, and they bought eight flashlights. Yeah. <laughs> and also, about in 1957, was the first mutual aid agreement which was the Walter County Mutual Aid Agreement. You had to have two pieces of equipment, 500 feet of hose, and only seven towns in Walter County qualified for it. Oh, wow. Um, out of 27, 26 towns. In 1957, I believe, <coughs> as far as we can tell, in talking to Prospect and what I've researched, um, Prospect Fire started and Jack Smith who was in Prospect he um, came to a meeting fire meeting in Stockton and asked what we would charge Stockton Fire Department to fight a fire in their town and the Stockton Springs firemen voted not to charge Prospect anything <laughs> Quite injury. And probably before they started a fire department, we covered Prospect also because it's just the way it was back then. You went wherever the fire was. So they had a um, CS Sporting Prospect and Stockton all were mutual aid in 1957. We still are. It's interesting, I joined the fire department in 1978, 79 time period, and we had a very good fire department, as we still do. In the 60s, they also had a very good fire department, because if you look what they had for equipment and what they could do, it was remarkable. They had fires in places. I, I remember as a little kid, the chemical plant caught fire one night, and we, our fire department, went there. Um, I remember house fires they had. The railroad set houses on fire um, in Sandy Point, in fact, one of them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Trying to find if there's anything substantial.
But anyway, we'll go on to now my time period. When I joined the fire department, we had three trucks and an ambulance. Um, the ambulance service was part of the fire department. The first ambulance bought was in approximately 1964. Charlie probably remembers it. And it was in a Packard. It might have been before that, Charlie, was it? It's about right. It yeah. used to set in Jean's yard. Right. <laughs> yeah, and it was gray. And there it stayed. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it was a nine, it was a 1950-something Packard station wagon type ambulance because that's what they had back then. It came from Brunswick Naval Air Station. It was civil defense and they it was more bag and drag. You got them in the ambulance and drove as fast as you could to the hospital. Before that it was the undertaker in CS Port that hauled people to the hospital in a hearse. Yeah, they would come and get you and take you to the hospital. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you kind of a gruesome but funny story. Uh, uh, Harry Patterson told the story to me. Um, they had a call, it was one of his first, and they had to pick up a body. And they, they used to do that too, and take it over to the undertakers and the ambulance and he had it in the back and he hit the brakes for something, a dog or something, and the person sat up. <laughs> and he turned around, I'm sorry ma'am, yeah, like that. So, you know, yeah. But uh, it was in 1970 something they bought their second ambulance which was a 1964 Chevrolet Suburban and then in 19, late 70s, that they bought, these are all secondhand folks, ambulances. They bought a um, travel all from Belfast Ambulance Service, which was like a suburban, it's like a truck station wagon. And uh, that one, when I joined, was still being used. And I remember you come out of the f fire station with it, and you touch the brakes, and it put your head against the windshield. <laughs> yeah. Anytime it sat for 10 minutes, you expect this to happen. And you didn't wear seat belts back then. No. You know, so you touch, just touch the brake, and it would do it. And they sent it and had it worked on, and nobody could figure out why it would do that. After you did that once, it never bothered again. And away you'd go, and you could slam the brakes on whatever you wanted to. It yeah. just kept on going, and slick as can be. So, in 1980s, in fact, Gene Ellis was um, fire chief when I started, and then Donnie Samba became fire chief. In the 80s, we had a railroad fire. It started down here and extended all the way to where the Rocky Ridge is where the railroad crossing is down in there on Steamboat and it lit over 250 um, acres of land on fire, burned three cottages and one barn and uh, we had two helicopters, we had trucks from Belmont, Belfast, Frankfort, Winneport, Orland, Sea Sport Prospect here fighting that fire mm -hmm. and manpower from as many towns. I don't remember how much, it was like 200 some men. Wow. And uh, the helicopter dropping water on the fire and we fought it for two days. And that's the first time I ever saw fire crowning through <coughs> the top of pine trees. Wow. And, I mean, it was, there was a lot of fi individual fire set. And for years, forestry used that fire in their training. They had pictures of that fire being fought, which was kind of cool. We made celebrities. <laughs> and uh, since then, we've had a lot of fires. We've had a number of chiefs, uh, all of them excellent. 
and we have an excellent ambulance service. We are proud to say that we, if you can look at this, this is pictures I have. That's an Irving tanker. It was loaded. That's the cab. We can come up and look at it later on, but that's the cab, what was left of it. Um, it was foggy and he was headed towards Bucksport, almost on the prospect line, and a pickup truck was crossways in the road and he caught it and he ripped his fuel tank on his tractor off and it instantly burst into flame. He jumped out of the tractor over the fire and the truck continued on its way down towards the river through the woods until it came to a stop. We arrived and we actually stopped it from exploding. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not bad. That baby mm -hmm. is loaded, it was loaded, I should say, with gasoline. And that's what's left of the tractor. Um, we've had some awesome saves. There's some pictures there of the condos when they burned. We had, uh, it was kind of comical again. We were at a fire. We were called to see us for mutual aid for a fire somewhere over there and they released us and we were headed back and somebody said on the south shore they were building condos they had two built one livable one needing sheetrock and the other one needing sheetrock so it was needing sheetrock needing sheetrock all finished and then one being built on the far right side. And Harry Patterson was chief, and somebody called it in and said, we see fire on the south shore. So one of our guys went down with his pickup because the trucks hadn't got here yet, and he found the one building on fire, really on fire. So the trucks, luckily, were already on the road. So they headed right down and they started putting water on that one building, trying to put it out. And one of the guys turned around and goes, hey, that one's on fire. And so Junior got on the radio, that'd be Harry Patterson, I call him Junior. He goes, Waldo, I've got more fire than I can really handle this time. Can you get a couple more towns coming our way to help us? And I don't remember how much water we put on it but we saved the one that was all built and we saved the one that was on the far right that was being built. We lost two. It was arson. They never could, never proved who did it, but uh, they burned pretty well flat. Um, we've never had anyone get hurt on a fire. Yeah. Um, I hope we never do. Um, we are mutual aid with Searsport, Belfast, Walnut County, Prospect, Frankfort, all the way around us. And we were for years the only town that was mutual aid with Hancock County. And I assume we still are. Uh, they don't call us very often. Once in a while we go there. We went for a forest fire back in, oh, 2000 something they had to help them but it's you know it's hard probably for a lot of people to visualize how much training today compared to how much training we had when I first started you put on a fire jacket and you wore what you got on underneath right here there was no pants no bunkers no fire there was some fire boots but not many you had whatever you could get on. Many times, leather boots were all I had. I got zapped electrically a couple of times from touching what I thought was a doorway in a burning building, and it was a refrigerator. Because everything was on underwater, the refrigerator was, you know, and you, you did what you could. I remember going, oh, that wall's hot. <laughs> oh, wait a minute, that's even, Wait a minute, that's electricity. <laughs> you know, two's good, three's better. <laughs> but 
Um, nowadays, we have to have turnout gear that costs us over $2,000. We have to replace it every so many years. If we get any oil on it, it's junk. It has to go in the trash can. Can't be given away, it has to go. Um, it costs us a lot of money to be a fire department. We're very fortunate we have one of the best. <laughs> Am I bragging? Yes. Uh, <laughs> we have six trucks. We have a boat. We do rescues. We train a lot of the time. I trained this morning on propane at um, Thibodeau Hot Top Plant in Prospect. I was up there for three hours and that was today's training. We're going to do a training on the 23rd at GAC Chemical and Sprague Energy and Irving. We fought a tank farm fire at Irving. It wasn't gasoline or diesel burning it was rubber the tank was empty but we fought it gene ellis is 76 three is he 76 mm. 70 something mm -hmm. and he was he fights the fire <coughs> with the rest of us as a pump operator i mean you got to be tough he's oh, 76 mm? yeah 76 He's my sister's age. Right, 76. Mm -hmm. So that would make him 78 or turning okay, 78, 78 this year. Yeah. Yeah. I'll leave it to her. Okay. <laughs> and we had the fire in Searsport at the tank farm quite a few years ago now. And uh, we were putting water in the tank from above. And Gene was the one running the pump. And I was backing trucks in, dumping in the pool, because we have a 3,500 gallon pool that we dump into so we can continually pump water and not run out. And they couldn't keep up. They couldn't get water to us fast enough. And the water going in the tank was coming back out of the tank and filling, they have a dike around the tanks. And it finally filled the dike up. So Gene is standing with water up to his knees in that dike. So finally I said, to heck with it. We picked the suction up and we put it back in the dike and just kept recycling it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we've got a great, like I say, a great fire department. We've got some of the best equipment around. You know, I'll put them up against any one in the county. So, yeah. Any questions? Are most of these guys uh, volunteers, don't right? Yeah. yeah. They're all volunteers, paid volunteers. If there's a fire, they get paid for it. And most towns are losing firefighters. They can't get enough. We have around 30. Oh, that's great. Uh, every fire, we average around 15. Mm -hmm. uh, thereabouts. Like Prospect just started getting people joining them. They were down to four guys. And by law, they can't fight an interior fire with four guys. You can't send two guys in. You have to have two in, two out, ready to go in. Um, there's all these rules and regulations nowadays. You only can be in there for a certain amount of time before you have to come out. And it's starting to change, which is probably for the better. And houses are changing. If we had to fight a hot fire in this house, I don't have a problem with having guys in here. But you're gonna fight a fire across the road at uh, the Ellis house, mm -hmm. it just, that's a trust roof. Mm -hmm. And trust roofs are collapsing when they get compromised by heat mm -hmm. and fire. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you have to be very cautious <coughs> about sending guys in. I'm not gonna lose a guy. Mm -hmm. Houses you can replace. Guys or girls, I'm sorry, because we do have girls too. <laughs> We've had girls for years on the fire department, not just auxiliary, but actually fighting fires. We had a fire at Sprague's, remember it well, and the young lady jumped in a fire truck, which was a big tanker at the time, and she headed out. And as she got in the town square, Freedom Harvey, who was also a fire, his job was truck four. And he came out of the apartment he was living in, and he's on the side of the road. And she pulls over, he jumps on the 
passenger running board and climbs in going down the road and they got going and she said freedom you need to be driving this and he said oh you're doing fine she said no we'll swap and they're going down the road you do what you gotta do you know? <laughs> middle of the night so i mean it was but that's that's the way we are yeah. i didn't say we were always <laughs> no, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. That was meant to be, yeah. Vern, I got a couple of things. First, sure. where, where did Jack live on School Street? It would be the Crockett House, which was just the below the school. Just, oh, school. just the next one below yeah. Yeah. Okay, for the school. And do you still use the Indian tanks or those? Oh, yes. You yeah. do. We weren't allowed to call them Indian tanks for a while. Correct. No. Yeah. But now yeah. they're back yeah. being called that. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So you still have them. So if somebody wants to burn, you can. Yep. Can people rent them, use them, borrow them, or? I let people department? use one tank mm -hmm. as long I can't empty the firehouse of one because. Well, yeah. And everyone, a lot of people here knew Matthew Thornton. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We called him. He he liked to be called Muggsy. Mm -hmm. Well. Oh well, who was the sheriff? Sheriff. Sheriff. Yeah. Sheriff. Went down Cape Road. No. Yeah, yep. Yeah. 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 I know, right? I'm like, let's find out. They, um, <laughs> he was. A lot of people thought he was a lot of things. He was one of the greatest firefighters yeah. you'll ever want. He loved to help people. He loved to do things. His job, main job, was to take care of those Indian tanks. He would take them apart every spring, clean them, grease them, and put them back together again. Yes. And I mean, when he passed away, we lost someone that was very Who dear was to us. Yeah. Matthew Thornton. Matthew. Yeah. 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 And uh, he was a great guy. Yeah. He would do anything for you. If you asked him to go in the burning house, he'd go right with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes, sir. All right. Um, let's see if I can describe this. Going down the Cape Road, as after you go past the Cape Docks Road, and there's that bend in the road just yep. beyond mm -hmm. that, well, about 30 well, feet well, out. There's a whole solid hole. Well, um, there's a, it was a small fire hydrant. Yes. Was that there for the, was that part of the um, that was a housing main, down there? That went, no, it went, it's an old hydrant, right? Oh, very old. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was for the docks. Okay, that, that, that should be brought up here and put in historical. Well, I don't know if it if it uh, is still on the ground, isn't it? it? Well, I haven't seen it for years, but you know, it's like thirty feet back from the road. It's nothing but all this all around. There's yeah. not a building you see anywhere. Originally, I think that's how you went to the Cape Docks to okay. with the pipeline. Okay. Originally, yeah. And I'm not sure about mm -hmm. that. No. And weren't there some um, uh, housing there for the workers? I believe so. There was a huge house right there yeah. somewhere. Yeah. And I'm, I don't know if there was a road because a pumping station, there was a pumping station down in there where the condos are now um, for the railroad. Uh, it's an artesian wet. Mm -hmm. And it was still full of water when they were clearing that land for the condo because we found it, mm -hmm. and I mean, it was this big around. Yeah. It was a big piece of this pipe, and it went down the ground, there was water, you could see it. And that's where the pump house was to fill locomotives and steamships mm -hmm. and whatever you needed. And there was, there was a tower on the hillside. That's that, where it was. Mm -hmm. Was yep. that part for firefighting yep. or water supply? It was water <laughs> supply. The water out of the well was pumped up into that standpipe and gravity took it down to the From ships and the well, locomotives. And there was another one in the Y, which was by Marsha's house. If you walk to the track crossing from her house, go left, there's a Y up in mm -hmm. there. And that was the other artesian well. Mm -hmm. Because locomotives had to be filled every so many miles. Steam. Because they're steam. Can yeah. still see that, that why? I mean, because all kind of alders now. I think it's growing. probably grown up. I haven't yeah. walked out in there for yeah. years. Yeah, I haven't. Maybe I've been walking. 
Well, would that place, he, this gentleman was speaking on, would that be somewhere across where Irving Carsons used to live? It'd be just vicinity? before it. Just yeah. before. Yeah, okay. on the right. Yeah. Between the campground and Irving's, more or less in that stretch there. Yeah. The right. Kind of a yeah. rise the there, yeah. kind of high right there. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's right. a big solid hole. Wow. Yeah, there were quite a few buildings there. Yeah. Boarding houses and stores and yeah. one had a bowling alley and oh, um, yeah. candy store. A yeah. lot of things. Confectionery store is what it was called. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. nice. yeah. It was right down there. And and Vern, any pictures of the first station in Cape with the, the drying tower stuff like that? Any pictures you know of? Oh, mm -hmm. No, there isn't. The bell is in the church on the Cape. Okay, that was the That's bell. That's all I know. Okay. But that is actually <coughs> our bell, and it was allowed for the church to have the bell. Yeah. Um, I told them if they ever tear the church down, I want the bell mm -hmm. <laughs> for our station. But it's hard to tell. I don't even know where the station was. Huh. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what happened to the. Fire, the fire alarm bell on top of the old town office. The siren? Yes. Yeah, the old one or the old, new one? When I was growing up. So that was I've got the oldest one in the firehouse. The mm -hmm. other one I've got to go get is behind the town office. Oh. They, they took it down. That's the one of the newer ones that sure we put there. up in my Is time on the fire department. Okay. And we replaced the old one. The old one was on a big stand that went way up. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, of course, I do remember the one that was the second one was not on the stand. No, that was like this tall. I think I more so remember the second one. Uh, but no, I don't think you'd remember the second one. I don't remember the real. I don't think you could see it. It's pretty high. Remember the sound, I guess I should say. Yeah. Yes. The yeah. The first one, when we were kids, yes. was on a steel mm -hmm. tripod. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when we lost that siren, the one that, the newest one. Mm -hmm. They took the old one, which still worked, mm -hmm. and we put it in the Trend parking lot on the old stand until they could get one to replace that. Okay. And yeah. it needed um, three phase in order to blow because of the three phase system. And the Trend was the only place there was three phase close, so it was stood up beside it for a little while. As I recall, it used to ring once at, I think, 11.30. Yep. Yes. Every day, mm -hmm. one yeah. ring, 11.30. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That was cool. It just was. to hear that at 11.30, you knew what time it was. And you know, it bring yeah. blood to your, yeah. <laughs> it make, I don't know, blood go down your back or something. You <laughs> hear that siren, you go, oh. Get your attention once yeah. a day. Yeah. And all the dogs would howl. <laughs> yeah, they would. That's right. Was that on a timer? Had to be on some kind nope. of timer system. It was set speak? off by the stores, okay. either Worcesters or mm -hmm. Trend wow. or whoever. Yeah. Was assigned to ring it. Just ring it at eleven thirty. Yeah. All the phones were running along here. They were yeah. Bowden. They were mm -hmm. um, yeah. Roscoe Varney's. Yeah. They were mm -hmm. Gene Ellis. Gene exactly. Ellis. He exactly. Gene had one in the house and one in the store. Yep. And um, I think Ralph Hall had one. Yeah, Donnie yeah, Sandman yeah. had one. Yeah. And when I got on, I had one down the Cape. It came through the phone line. Yeah. And eleven thirty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The siren up in Winterport it still goes off at noon every day. Yep. Yeah. I think I've heard that. Milford yeah. does yeah. too, yeah. where yeah. I'm from. Yeah. Just right down. Yeah. In Milford, it does too, time. where I'm yeah. from. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Yeah, Civil Defense used to pay for a lot of this. Mm -hmm. um, kind of funny, we have a picture that you can look at, but it has a Metro, which is a old bread truck like. Mm -hmm. It was Civil Defense. Well, if you ever rode in one, it's like the old milk trucks. You had a seat for the driver and that's it. <laughs> yeah, and the door slid shut. And I remember going to something, and I don't remember what it was. Ralph Hall was driving it, and I was standing up in the other doorway. You're three inches off the ground when you're standing in the doorway, and the doorways wouldn't shut. So, middle of wintertime, it was quite chilly in that sucker, and 
you had a generator that was behind you, and they had spare backboards and all kinds of stuff all in it. And we were doing, I don't know, it seemed like we were doing 110, but we were doing probably 35 of that, <laughs> because that's as fast as it would go. And we're going up through, and that it would do this. It had no duels on the back, so it raw. <laughs> and you're in the doorway, hanging on. And, <laughs> and there was no seat belts, and it had all those flip seats like they used to have in yeah. these, and on a post. Mm -hmm. You know, so you set up, and your feet were up in the air for the clutch and the gas and stuff, and you kind of climbed down to get out. But I think Ralph and I went. I don't remember, there was a skydiver, I guess, that skydived off Waldo Mountain or something. And that's where we were headed because he crashed. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it was stuff like that was, that's what we had back mm -hmm. then. Yeah. We didn't have much. In 1978, they replaced that American La France with a new Ford that Gene and Jimmy Shera went all the way to Mississippi and drove back. That was quite a combination. Gene Ellis is this tall, <laughs> and Jimmy Shera was this tall. <laughs> but they went up and they got it and they brought it back and we replaced it uh, around 2007, I guess. We bought a truck in California over the phone and had it shipped here on a tractor trailer and we uh, came with all kinds of guys said is there any equipment you'd like to have with it I got a bunch of old equipment and we said just throw everything you want on the truck we'll take it <laughs> and we gave what we didn't want away and uh, there was hose and everything else and we ran that truck until uh, five years ago when I replaced it because the pump we paid $30,000 for it, and the pump was getting real tired, and it was going to cost $30,000 to replace the pump. Mm -hmm. So we bought one for $21,000 down out in Mount Desert, and it was came with ladders, hose, everything for $21,000. only had 14,000 miles on it, mm -hmm. and that's what we have for a main pumper now. Mm -hmm. We also bought a rescue, which is our big box rescue, out of New York. We went and drove it home, and that cost us $30,000. And we've had that for, I don't know, 17 years, 18 years, and it's still going strong. So, I mean, we like to buy trucks. We, we built a lot of our trucks because we don't like spending money. <laughs> you know, the most we ever spent was $95,000, and that was for a new chassis. And we built our built the only the truck the way we wanted to. We bought a old truck from Orlin that was 1965, just for the body. And then we sold the truck. Mm -hmm. You know, kept the body. Whatever we could do to save money. And we've got some nice trucks. And like I told you, the Amer the pump, which was a Champion pump that was purchased back in the 40s, we still have it. We had it, when the mill was there, they rebuilt it completely, and it still pumps 511 gallons an hour. Wow. It only made the pump 500, but it does a little better every time we have to test it every year. Have, we have someone come down and do the testing of all the trucks have to be tested. Um, but we put that on a brand new chassis with that old body and that pumps like it was brand new. Well, I have a spare for it in the back room. They're easy to replace. Two guys just pick it up, four bolts and <laughs> a few lines and you're ready to replace it if you have to. Well, How much does it cost? Total department now per year. Well, Last year it was a hundred and four thousand, I believe. And that is for services. That is everything you can think of. That is uh, for payroll, fuel, uh, fuel for the building, fuel for the trucks. 
that's training, and that's uh, insurances, mm -hmm. um, electricity. Mm -hmm. I yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, equipment that we have to replace, like we replaced all of our SCBAs over a four-year period at twenty-five thousand dollars a piece. Whoa! Yeah. And you get that money from the town. Yes. I got an old scuba tank if you want. It. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're illegal, <laughs> and it, it's strange because you can go buy a ladder. But I can't use it. Yeah, I can go I buy the exact same ladder, but it's got to have a sticker on it saying, uh, yeah. uh -huh. it's the same ladder. I know. Yeah. Yeah. And it costs you $200, it costs us $400 <laughs> yeah. or whatever. Those are the games. That little sticker. Yeah. yeah. The it's the same with boots. I can go to Hamilton Marine buy fire boots. Yeah. Can't use them. Yeah. I have to have that sticker on. Is something wrong somewhere? <laughs> yeah, you're right. There yeah. is. Yeah. yeah. And it's just the way that liability is. Well, it is. Factors <laughs> liability. Yes, sir. <coughs> on that railroad fire in the 80s after burned some camps, one that I thought was interesting, one of the stories I just heard was that it was a camp they thought they had it all in control, and someone went around back, and it was a you know, power line, phone line burning, bringing the fire to the building. I wonder if that's, a, of course. That wasn't uh, no quite true because there was no power to any. It might have been a party. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the the only one was the house. Oh, yeah. And garage, which was Foley's place, mm -hmm. and we saved the house. The garage we couldn't. It was twenty feet from the railroad, oh, yeah. and that was the first thing that caught fire when mm -hmm. the railroad caught it on fire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And. Back then, they were running what they call F7 locomotives, which had EMD engines in them, and, but they were kind of underpowered. So if you have a, a spark arrestor in the locomotive, you, these engines are huge, and they're long as from here to that wall, and uh, they carbon up when they're idling. So they're in Searsport, and they're doing switching, they're idling, they're not going wide open. Then they start up the grade, this is all uphill. And when they start up the grade, they're putting the fuel right to it. Um, and they start really dogging down. So what they used to do is take the, res the spark arrestor out. And so when they started coming out of here, they'd have a chimney fire, it's like a chimney fire. The stack would carbon up, and the carbon would catch fire, and it would put sparks or flames out of it. And uh, if you want to see what it looks like, look it up online, and they'll show you some massive um, stack, they call them stack fires. And I mean flames shooting 20 feet in the air out of them. And that's how it started. Yeah, okay, so when they say the train threw a spark, yeah, it was through the stack. Most generally, it's yeah. through the it's, stack. I was thinking down by the wheels, wheels yeah. created yeah. some yeah. kind of. Right. Uh, we don't see them that much now because yeah. they're newer engines that are more reliable. But back when we were kids, yeah. those big blue ones, which yeah. were the older locomotives from the forties and right. the fifties, they would head up through here and they'd be putting what we used to say putting the pickle right to her. Yes, yeah. and. Uh, they would put the flames right out through it, mm -hmm. coming right out the stack, mm -hmm. oh, over fueling. Yeah. I've got some background color for you. Sure. <laughs> and you're free to use these. Okay. <laughs> Do you remember repainting the old LaSalle? LaSalle? I don't remember the LaSalle. The LaSalle. What was the LaSalle? Or La France, right? The American La France, yep. yeah. Yeah. They had skeet sandblasting. I, I had it repainted. I mean, I was part of that. Do yes. you remember that he forgot to put rubber in front of the yes. radiator? Yes. Oh. Yeah. Oh. It was like a pressurized colander when he got done. Yeah. Never leaked. Huh? It never leaked. <laughs> oh, it didn't? No, never leaked. Well, see, Skeet told the story, so he got a little better. He got a little better as he went along? Yeah. 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 No, it never leaked. Um, we did it in Bruce Snowman's garage. We stripped it. 
Um, he didn't do it. He started to do the cab. And then that happened. And he discontinued. He went and just did the body. Yeah. Because your sandblaster puts out such big pedals, it would warp the panels on the cab. And a lot of people won't use sandblast on anything they care about. Right, because, because it will pit it. Yeah. Uh, you have to be very careful. But it had, the military paint was very hard to get off. We ended up hand sanding it. Yeah, and razor blades to scrape it down because it had military paint under the red and the red was put on the paintbrush. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we ended up doing that. We did it in Bruce Stoneman's garage and Junior Fasten painted it. Mm. And it's, like I say, down there. Um, it's, you know, it was, it was fun doing it. It was a nice truck. The, uh, the old ambulance she told about, the Packard? Yep. Uh, that thing sat in Gene's yard for a year I knew about. And in the winter, that's where us kids would keep our beer. Keep it cold <laughs> under, under the ambulance. Yep. Well, one spring day, Ira Reed from down in Sandy Point yep. come up from Florida every year. His wife had a heart attack. And he let us know. And all of a sudden, Harry Patterson and Gene and I, and we're trying to get the package started for the first time. Or at least the first time in 18 months. And it wasn't working, no matter what we did. Harry tied onto that with a logging chain, took his four-wheel drive, pulled us up the hill and over to Sandy Point. We went down Sandy Point Hill in excess of 80 mile an hour trying to jump start an automatic. automatic. Yeah. Oh, wow. Didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't work. <laughs> so finally Ira put a thin mattress in the back of his own station wagon and took his wife to the hospital. Oh. In the back. Yeah. 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 And what, uh, the siren you referred to, when I got in law enforcement in Alaska, I was up this little village in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge. And they didn't have any fire trucks, but we had, <laughs> instead we had these enormous Ansel fire extinguishers on wheels that tall. Yep. And we could go to a house and try to knock it down with that. But we had no way to, communicate there was a problem. So I called Gene and said, How, tell me who the hell makes that uh, fire siren of yours. And I don't know, I think somebody had to go on the roof and get the, Probably. Get the data. <laughs> and by golly, the town ordered it and installed it. But what none of us factored in was, you know, it's got those cones on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And inside the cones are the cutouts where this thing spins and the noise comes out. Well, in the Arctic, when it snows, it isn't pretty and fluffy, and it's 80 knot winds, horizontal snow. And first big snow came along and it packed <laughs> everything inside with snow. And we didn't know it, and they turned it on and burned it out. Yeah, it doesn't take long either. But, you know, you guys got credit for a good assist. <laughs> <laughs> and last but not least, probably most important, for whatever reason, I lost the context of this. Diane just said she's learned to shut her mouth. <laughs> Somebody mark the calendar, please. <laughs> Um, another good story, the, um, it was um, a race with fire trucks. I can't remember, I think it was Gene Ellis and I can't remember the whole story, but uh, they were going to a fire and one had the 42 and one had something else. And maybe you remember it, Charlie, I, and it was before my day, but uh, they were coming back or they were going to and, and uh, one of them said I'll beat you there and the other one said 
Oh, you're not going to beat me there. James Reardon, I think, was Oh, oh that sounds yeah. about right. Yeah. Anyway, they were, maybe Roger Snow was the one driving. Oh, oh that but I, can't, I can't remember now, but uh, whoever it was driving, all of a sudden, somebody came short on them. Now, you got to remember, the, these trucks don't do 100 miles an hour. They were lucky if they were doing probably 35, 40. But that was the race to see who could pass who, and somebody stopped quick, and the other one ran into that one. Oh, oh God! No. Yeah, <laughs> didn't do much damage. They were trucks, you know, but yeah. Yeah. just it was yeah. comical. Yeah. yeah, and every so often they'd lay a fire truck over. Really? Yeah, you know, mud season, <laughs> sides of the road, pretty soft. Yeah. You drive a truck, you want to stay on the center line and run the car off the road that's coming <laughs> towards you. Yeah. You can pull him back on, but you can't pull the fire truck on very easily. So you have to be cautious. Yeah, Roger Snow loved to get out the wrecking bar if there was a chimney fire. Yeah. <laughs> uh, whether it was needed or not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Roger was quite a character. I yeah. remember one time we had a, a fatal accident towards the Bucksport Bridge, and there was quite a few cars involved. And we had the road shut down. This guy from Massachusetts, and he was going to drive through the scene, and they were sending them up the Meadow Road. And Roger Snow was directing traffic at the Meadow Road, and he said, "No, you got to go up this Meadow Road." And uh, guy says, I'll tell you, and I won't use the words he used, but uh, I'll be going where I want to go. And Roger says, you're going to go without a headlight. And the guy says, you like this. And the guy gave him another little bit of lip, and Roger took that headlight right out. Stick he head. And uh, state cop came over, said, what's the problem over here? And Roger says, this gentleman won't go up that road. He wants to go straight through the scene. And State cop looked at the guy and he said, uh, is that true, sir? And the guy says, that is correct. And he says, well, let me tell you something, sir. If you don't turn up that road, I'm going to have this gentleman take out your other headlight. And then <laughs> on the other side of the road. <laughs> but that's Roger. He, yes. yeah, he straightened it out one way or the other. I don't know if anyone has any more questions. All right, I got one more. Sure. The, uh, I just happened to see the picture there, the Fort Point Hotel. Is there anything known what firefighting efforts? Because there was no department that there was that there none that I could find. I found something. Kathy found it for me <coughs> upstairs. They had to write a report about every fire hmm. in the town paperwork, and I found a paper that mentioned there was a fire at that. And it burned flat, obviously, what's that, three stories high or four? Four, yeah. yeah. And there's no way they had no ladders, they had no thing yeah. but buckets. Yeah. And even if they were down there, it would have been a hard haul, especially if it was low tide, to get water up there yeah. in the bucket. Probably in the hotel itself, maybe buckets of sand on each floor or something like that. Probably. Probably it was the extent of their Yeah, and their I mean. Convention. When the mortgage and the insurance start rubbing together, uh, <laughs> most generally the buckets of sand are empty. Yeah. Uh, they, yeah. Which is rumored that's why it started. Mm -hmm. oh. Wouldn't be the first one in town either. No, there wouldn't be. And a few of them. I mean, that's what they said about the Cape Docks, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Whether it did or not, no one will ever know. We have fire marshals now that come out and we know. yeah and we find out where the fire began if they can but I back know. then they didn't Everybody in town knows. Yeah. when we had the fire at the old town office just this winter I don't know if everyone knows we had one but we did um, the upper middle floor was totally involved and on fire and it's a brick building and the floors hold the bricks together. So if the floors are compromised, the walls can do what they want to. And we made our attack on it 
with one truck and started putting water to it. But we couldn't go in because it was coming up through the floor on the next floor. So you couldn't see anything and everything else. We did save the building and it's, he's going to rebuild, yeah. which is great. Mm -hmm. But the fire marshal came and he looked it over. He said, I don't know how you guys stopped it. <laughs> so that was a good compliment. Yes. It was electrical. Yeah. Yeah, that's where it started. It was in the wall. Electrical outlet. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Has he started to burn? Uh, he yeah. took out everything that was wet. And that was the start, and he was waiting for the insurance to pay him. So I don't know if he started redoing it or not. I yeah. hope he does. He intends to because yeah. uh, Alex, someone who is going to be doing the work, has contacted the Historical Society about getting more information about the building. Yep. And the fact that there was a firehouse down in the bottom yep. there. That's something I don't know. It'll be I don't know very, how long it was there. It doesn't make any no. difference. It's mm -hmm. more of the history. It was also it was, a jail. It was a jail, yeah. 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 I've been in there before. Yeah. It was, it was a jail and... Uh, not, not, not in chains. No, no, not that type of jail. <laughs> was, it was for um, transients. Yeah, and Dan says that's not the reason there are bars there, so I don't know. No, there is, that is something uh, because there was a jail that was down by the school, old school, at one mm. time. Yes. And that was meant for transients. Yep. Yeah. So it's hard to say. Yeah. I mean, it's a beautiful building, and I would hate to see it disappear yeah. from yeah. there. I mean, you look at some of the buildings in town that were saved, um, where the old bank was and post office, mm. which is the building where the park is now, that caught fire and burned sometime in the 60s or 70s and didn't lose the building. That was pretty good. And they didn't use a ladder truck. So, you know, I mean, that's pretty same pretty much. That's cool. And we've got a lot of wooden buildings in the square. Well, Vern has some good pictures here that you may want to come down and check out and I am going to go upstairs. I think I know exactly where the plan is that was put out by the water company for the Cape Docks showing the water lines yeah. and uh, the buildings that were there. Yeah. So I'll go up and if I do know right where it is, I'll bring it down so people can look at that. And this was another interesting program. Yeah. We appreciate the knowledge that yeah. a lot of people have to give Thank us. You. Did you also know, have you got any information on, this is a different subject, but it's close, um, The first one of the first Airbnbs we had in town? Was that the... Railroad car, yeah. thank you. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yes, we that do. That was the vice president of the Bangor and Aroostook, right. and he used it for a cottage. Yeah. Yeah. And he put it at the bottom of Maple Street. Yeah. Right. He had a spur made up onto where he wanted it, and he used, I can't remember, seven box cars, and the locomotive, the spur was just quickly put in, and the locomotive was too heavy go up where he wanted it, so he put the box cars and he pushed it up in there and that was his summer cottage. He was the uh, yeah. CEO wow. of the Bangor and Aristic Railroad. Hmm. This guy did a week or so as a kid, yeah, the old whistle stop. Yes, the old whistle oh, stop. Right. Uh, Gertrude's uh, Lancaster, yes. he, too, he owned it for a while. They bought I, it. I got a friend who has some of the furniture that was in that when they Oh, wow. That, yeah. 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 It, it was a, it was a, um, sleeper? No, it was a, it was a, uh, what do you call it? Pullman car, but it was a, oh, shoot, singer, um, we have a opera. Clip, you have a clip, clip yeah. the An opera somewhere. singer's personal yeah. car. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I've got the, 
write up, and I meant to bring it for the historic site, and I forgot. I found it in that house that's there, because I went down to give that, to um, plow their driveway for them. Mm -hmm. They're rebuilding it. And I saw it on the wall. So I asked them if I could borrow it and get a copy of it. And it's written by Gertrude Lancaster, who was a correspondent for a newspaper. And she wrote it about a house, that car in Stockton that she purchased to use as a cottage and rental. Wow. <laughs> so when I, up until the time I was a teenager, there would be several weeks in the summer when the bank, one of the roosters, would have a road <laughs> crew come to do the line. And so they would, they would park for two weeks just behind our house uh, on the siding where Sandy Point on well, the old station. Sandy, yeah, so if some of you are familiar with the Sandy mm -hmm. Point Depot was, there were side, there was the main track and there were sidings on both sides. <coughs> now, they would pull up on the siding closest to our to our house. It's, it's, you know, same men every year. They were road crew. They'd stay in Sandy Point for a few weeks, work on the track for a bit, and then, you know, go on up. Well, so that was an experience for my uh, growing up. But they used what they used to do is our uh, we had the, that's when the big barn was still very close to the railroad tracks, and they would run an electrical cord from that rail car to the, our barn, which was electrified, and you know we they'd get the electricity for there. But it was always like one of the events we had in the summer. Oh, so yes. Yeah, yeah, and it, they and it was fitted out. Um, you know they had the bump beds in there, if you will, like you would expect for you know construction crew going. And yeah, that would just be right it. There. Yeah, yeah. And they had somebody the stove and everything else, so the cook would be always there or something. And you know, every once in a while, you know, they they'd get a you know, my grandma would send down something to, for them to eat, or some tell tell the crew to you know just go to the garden if they needed any produce or anything. Yeah. So it's kind of it's kind of an interesting piece the road of stock. Road her it? house goes down and used to be a station. Sandy Point Railroad yeah, Station yeah. and a yard. Yes. Tracks. And when Doug McFarland bought it, yes. he wanted a load of gravel down there. Yep. And my wife was pregnant with our son, and so she was riding with me. And I had my big dump truck, which has 12 yards of gravel on, and it was in the fall and it had rained. And there's leaves on the road that goes down oh, there, yes. and there's a big corner down in there. So I'm headed down it. And I touched the brakes, and it was just sliding. Mm -hmm. And the corner was coming up, and we're going faster and faster. And I go, hang on, and I just let off the brake and just give it to her, and hung it hard right. I missed the trees. We got down there, and we dumped our load of gravel, and then we couldn't get back out. Uh, yeah. Well, when we were empty. kids, we used to slide down that hill, just yep. like you said, just slide down that road. And we would, uh, we'd also slide it down the main road of St. Paul yeah. Hill. So I got there by the trestle, but we live to tell about it. But, but uh, today that would not go. Anyway, um, but it would. You'd get, you'd get going down there. And I, I can remember one time, uh, Scott and Dale West and I were on our toboggan, and we got going really fast. And we got down to the hill. We went over the tracks. And this is when the train was coming <laughs> three or four times a day. Over the tracks. And, uh, <laughs> partially down the hill like doing the river road. Gee, <laughs> we just could not oh, stop. Yeah, yeah. How did you get out eventually? Well, we just, well it, 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 it stopped eventually. Thankfully, thankfully we didn't run into any trees, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, it would just stop and we just, you know, kind of got up and walked back up the hill and did the same thing again. Right and, yeah, yeah. I thought about taking and going across the tracks to Angel's driveway yeah. <laughs> yeah. with the dump truck, but I brought the dump truck up to the tracks and I got out and my fuel tank would only clear by. Yeah, yeah. So and aluminum doesn't go well to steel. So then I s said to Melissa, I said, well, kind of hang on, we'll try something. And I backed as far down the tracks towards Drew's as I could. And I got a run for it and got her up into higher gear. Just, I must've been doing 45 when I headed up the hill. And I downshifted a couple times. I made it to the top. She spun the whole way. But I made it. That's when you want to be loaded. Yes, exactly. 
Like, Doug needed the gravel down there. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why. There's mud down there. Yeah. Well, we thank you. And I have all kinds of pictures yeah. if you have any question hey, where it was. Some nice ones. Yep. You can look at it. We've collected over the years a lot of pictures. And there are refreshments in the other room. And it will be about 20 minutes before we start our business meeting. Nice. Thank you. Thank you.